This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 103 of the Healthy Critters Radio on the Horse Radio Network. Healthy Critters Radio is brought to you by Biostar US. Find them online at biostarus.com. I'm Tigger. And I'm Patty. And I'm producer Jen. And you're at the Healthy Critters Radio Show. On today's show, we share common dog training mistakes. Breed of the show is the Basenji. In Critter Nutrition, the topic is flavorings in feed and supplements. And in Coffee Clatch, we ask, what wild animals would you like to have a conversation with? Listen in. Jennifer, I understand you've been on vacation. Woohoo! Uh, for regular regular listeners to the Healthy Critters Radio Show, will note that the show's a couple of days late this time because <laughs> Jennifer's fault. Jennifer's it's fault. My fault. Mm-hmm. So that so that I could join in the fun, Tigger and Patty agreed to record it a little bit later than normal, and I'm so glad. But we had a great time. We were on the second se- is it semi annual Horse Lovers Cruise? It's every other year Horse Lovers Cruise. And what happens is we pick out a cruise that seems like a convenient date for a lot of horse people. And we just pick a random cruise to wherever. And we hop on a boat with 30 or 40 of our auditors <laughs> and listeners of the Horse Radio Network and have a great time and just talk endlessly about horses and have a good time. So that's what we that did. That sounds like, like a lot of fun. It was a blast. We played one night, we played Equestrians Against Normalcy, which is. <laughs> The horse version of the game I you just think it is. Love that. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, it is an epic battle. It went to approximately 1 a.m. Whoa. Yes. So that was a good time. And we also have, we, and this is something again we, we do on every one of the cruises. We had a game show night. And last time we played Family Feud, this time it was a trivia night. And we had a great time Ooh, with that. One. And the trivia good night one. broke the tie for last place with a <coughs> stick horse sprint race. Awesome. <laughs> oh, wow. So good that time sounds like that fun. A good time with that by all. If you're not an auditor yet, go to Horse Radio Network and find the auditor banner there. Check it out. See if you want to do that. So that's what we did. But something I got to thinking about, because when I came home from my cruise, I discovered my horse standing in his stall with a Fair amount of sedation on board and a big old bandage on his leg. Oh, no. Oh, yes. He played hokey pokey with the wire fencing and he lost. <gasps> oh. Oh, Jennifer. He, he decided to do this literally as we were driving home. No. Yes. So luckily, our landlord takes care of our horses because he, cause we kind of share the horse facilities here. And she was right here. So she's like, look at this. Nigel's torn himself all up. Let me text <sighs> pictures to the vet. And the vet came right out and. Got them all wrapped up and things. So it's been an interesting few days since I came home. Oh, jeez. How many stitches? No stitches, just lots of peeled off skin. Oh. And his hock's about the size of a Oh, Oh, yeah, basketball. Yeah, basketball, yeah. And he got somehow managed to get it up into his stifle so that that little tendinous piece that is right above the fl- skin flappy between their stifle and their flank is pretty well bruised and awfully tender. So we'll see if there's any lasting effect from that. But yeah, he's not a habit camper. But what I got uh. to thinking about after all this, here's my takeaway. Because Nigel's really good at trying to kill himself. <laughs> it's like a <laughs> par of course. There were 30, 35 people or thereabouts on the cruise. So if we divide it roughly, somewhere around 14 families were represented. 15 families. Of those, at least three of them that I know of had veterinary emergencies for their horses while oh, we were away. Oh, my gosh. So if we need to do the math. <laughs> mm. We need to do the math. So statistically speaking... 
If you go away for five days, you have X chance of having a vet come out <laughs> while you're away. Mm, mm-hmm. Luckily, everybody's fine. Don't worry. But yeah, that's that's really what I took away from this. I'm going, really? And you know, it's so kind of colors of vacation. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. When you're relaxing on a cruise and you get a call from your vet saying, I had to do and you're like, Okay, I'm supposed to be here relaxing, de-stressing. <laughs> yeah, not fun. Or just on your way home. I yes. mean, I, I just had a great time. This was fantastic. I feel so rested. Ah! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Jana made the wise decision. That's my landlord and caretaker of Nigel and Scooter while we were away. To, to, she didn't even bother calling me. She said, you know, you can't do anything about it. You're on your way home. The vet said he's fine standing right where he's at. You know, so she just said, you know, you'll, you'll find out about it in about an hour and a half, which I did. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I've, I've always been, well, and maybe I could, I could quiz you two with this one. I've always been the sort, if I can't do anything about it, don't tell me when I'm away. If I'm on vacation and there's nothing I can do, don't notify me and say, oh, by the way, so-and-so has colic and the vet's been out and he said it'll be fine. I can't do anything about it, so don't tell me. <laughs> how about you, yeah. Patty? How, how, how are you about that kind of thing? You know, I, as you were saying that, I was like, that sounds so attractive to not, <laughs> you know, not, if, if, if you can't do anything, like, that sounds so reasonable, but I am way too much of a control freak and would want to. I am right there with you. Yeah, know the details, um, I, but I'll I tell you what. everything in case something wasn't was overlooked or yeah. did you do this? And uh, Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's just from yeah, being a control freak, but I, I will tell you, I wish that I could be what like that way, Jennifer, because two years ago we went on this glorious vacation with the family and we had a young horse that was in training and the, the owner of the horse had been away for three months. And I told her that when she got home, I'd be gone for a week, which she knew, blah, 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 blah. And I said, okay, but you need to understand you haven't been here. You're not to get on the young horse. Clear? Everybody said clear. Got it. Everybody, guess what? Oh, no. She got on the young horse oh, and no. it took off. And I, I was so proud of myself because I'm not really good at, in circumstances like that, truly expressing how I feel. Well, I can express how I feel. I shouldn't go truly how I felt at that moment, but I was able to say, oh my gosh, you just literally tried to ruin my vacation. Like, and I was so, cause I, it was just one of those things where I needed to know what happened, even though in reality, I couldn't do anything about it, mm-hmm. but I was able to, at the moment, because of how I felt express to that person how important it was to remember our conversation. So that part of it became good. But if I, I mean, in the end, in the end, it didn't ruin my vacation, but it certainly stressed me out for that entire day and everything turned out fine. But it was just one of those things where honestly, Jennifer, what you're saying is why, why tell me? Because there was nothing I could do about it. And the only benefit was, is that I was able to in the moment, share exactly how I was feeling. And I use a lot of big words. So yeah, I don't know. I've been, pr- I, I'm, I feel pretty lucky. I mean, I, I, most of the time that I've gone away, I mean, people keep in touch with me and whatever. And I've been pretty fortunate to have good people handle things when I'm gone, but I guess it's, it's just, oh God, what I, I, it's sort of like you come back from that nice, long, wonderful time away, having fun. And then you see your horse like that. So I, that, God bless you. <laughs> that can't be fun. Well, I, I had an interesting, totally unrelated to this, but I, I um, had a conversation in the Wellington Dog Park with one of our listeners. Oh, no. Oh, really? Yes. And she's from Canada. And she said, you know, I, I love healthy critters and I listen to every episode. Can you talk about the training mistakes maybe that that you all have made with your dogs. So I thought, you know, I, in in honor of Susan, my Canadian friend, we're going to talk about the mistakes we've made in dog training. Oh, right. Oh, that's, oh that's I, have, I have plenty to contribute here. <laughs> yeah, me too. How long is the show? <laughs> 
So our roundtable discussion is about the training mistakes we've made from dogs and je- with dogs. And Jennifer has has volunteered. <laughs> she thinks she has the most experience, but Patty and I are pretty much convinced <laughs> that oh, we exceed her in experience of making mistakes in training. But we're we're being nice people. Mm-hmm. We're going to let Jennifer mm-hmm. go first. I do have a question. Are we just talking about today or are we talking about <laughs> over the... <laughs> go ahead, Jen. <laughs> today, last week, the entire year. <laughs> okay. I think my my mistake is I'm really, really, really inconsistent with the dogs. I'm mm-hmm. I'm sort of dedicated to the whole horse thing. I'm still inconsistent. That's always my favorite go-to. Mm-hmm. But I will be... Oh, goody, I got my dog to sit. And then I don't practice it, you know? And then I wonder, well, he won't sit when we're going for a walk and there's scary and interesting objects around us because I haven't practiced for six months. <laughs> I don't <laughs> practice. That's, mm. that's my number one Okay, right there. Lack of practice. But that's a big one. Yeah, it's a biggie. Mm-hmm. But also, actually continually practicing the wrong thing is a big one. <laughs> well, there you go. I'm, I do that with my horses all the time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Tigger, what about you? Uh, I would say not quick enough to reward. Uh-huh. Ah. Because it has to be so fast. I'm not talking about just treating. I'm just talking about the pet or the good boy or the, you know, immediate, recognition to the dog that they did something right. Right. Rather than just not saying you did something wrong. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. It, that's, that's interesting. Cause I would, cause that's, a, that actually surprises me. I think you're probably, I don't know. I think you're probably better at it than you think you are. But I would say my biggest thing is, is that I do, I'm really, really good at all the basic um, sort of stuff. I'm really, really consistent when like, you know, when you have a puppy and I get them to do the recall pretty well and I get them to sit and whatever, but I then sort of just get to this one point where I don't do anything else. You know what I mean? Like I, uh-huh. you never they're, they're very kindergarten. Well, yeah, a little <laughs> bit more than kindergarten. Let's just in dressage terms, let's just say they get to a solid first, first level, level, second <laughs> level, yeah, maybe second. I've done, I've started the Canada walks, you know what I'm saying? Um, so they're, you know, in, you know, and they appear to be extremely well behaved and, and for the most part are, but then when you get to my house <laughs> and granted I have a few, so, but I think that that's where it probably I lack is the content. Cause I just go, Oh good. Look, they're coming when I call and they sit when they come. And, you know, I always have treats in my pocket. In fact, my number one issue when I fly is taking sugar cubes and dog biscuits out, you know, and I'm like, I hate throwing these out, please take them home, you know, but so I'm good at that, but it's just that it's that next step of stuff. Interesting. I would say it was my week. So point. that being said, from your point of view, Tigger, what are the trained skills that all humans need to know how to teach their dogs? Sit, come down, off, Leave it. And I just started an experiment with Keen. Which one's Keen? Because you have a heap Keen of Keen is my now. puppy. Okay. <laughs> yes, I do. She's got a tribe. <laughs> I do. <laughs> my own Aussie tribe. It's, it's the Tiggy tribe. <laughs> and so I have been using actually a horse sound to get his attention. And so I go. Mm-hmm. And as soon as he recognizes it and sees it and comes, he gets rewarded. And I find that when I'm out in public with him and he gets a little distracted and I can just go, and he's like right on me again. So that to me has turned out to be a really great, you know, without saying, Keen, Keen. And, and, And I had to learn not to nag. Just like I had to learn not to nag with my legs, on a horse, mm-hmm. I had to learn not to nag with the dogs. So give me an example because I totally get the nag thing. And that makes me crazy because I ride around the neighborhood here a lot. Lots of folks have dogs in their yards. And they're screaming bloody murder when I go by because their dog is barking. Right. I understand that. My, do- my horse doesn't care that the dog barks. I don't care that the dog barks, but they obviously do. And it has absolutely no effect on the dog. 
Right, exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. But part of that is because the dog pr- may very well get nagged at. So might what might be an example that you would consider nagging your dog? Okay. Keen, sit. Keen, sit. Keen, sit. Keen, sit. <laughs> so, Tigger, are you saying that he won't sit? <laughs> <laughs> So you say Keen sits six times and Keen doesn't sit. That that is to, no. That's an ex, it would be an example of a na, a nagging. Got it. Problem. And it's it's nagging because he's already just, sat and he, you keep telling him, or because he doesn't no, and you haven't changed he, it. Correct. Aha. Uh-huh. Got it. And I learned this from a really good dog trainer. You have to make the request, Keen sit, and wait. Mm-hmm. Give them some time. It's just Be like patient. on a horse. Mm-hmm. When you're teaching them, you know, shoulder in, they don't just, as soon as you put on your inside leg and get have them on the outside rein and position them, they don't just automatically go into shoulder in. They're like, yeah. okay, I'm, I don't like your leg against my ribs or, you know, it's, they're Why trying to figure that? out what you want. And so I, I, again, I learned this from a very good trainer, wait. Mm-hmm. And then if they don't respond, then maybe say it in a different voice or a different tone or change your position, you know, get the dogs back refocused on you. Jeez, I'm guilty of all these. Wow. (laughs) Well, so we all are. Yeah. It's an art to training a human, a dog, a horse. It's anything. Well, you know, the biggest thing is patience and consistency. Yeah. Which is, which we've all said. I mean, and you know, you know, and always being able to evaluate the situation. I mean, you know, my, my younger dog catch his big thing right now is he thinks it's a super great idea to go chase the thousands of deer that, you know, come through the property. And this is actually going to be a a positive thing rather than a mistake. I always have dog treats, which I shared. And every time I call him and he comes to me, he always gets a treat. Now there's been plenty of times where I've called him and he's giving me the paw. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's because he was out chasing the deer, you know. But today, it's really rainy and cold. And, you know, one of those days where you're just like, oh, my gosh, I just want to go home. And there was all of the earth's population of deer were in, on my way out to my truck. And he just, I mean, you know, he's an Aussie, so he just lowered his little haunches. Man, he was just gone. And the minute I said, hey, catch, he stopped dead in his tracks and came Whoa. running back. Wow. And I was like, I, you know, and it's kind of funny that, you know, that we're talking about this because I was like, well, damn, well done, you know. And, you know, instead of giving him one little biscuit, I gave him like 15. <laughs> so the thing is, is that, you know, being repetitive and being patient, they really will pay off. And I think that's probably the hardest thing is, is that we're all busy. Our yeah. lives get in the way of things. And it's real easy to just think, oh, geez, you know, this just, this is just isn't working. Same thing with horses. You know, you just have to consistently keep the same thing because we keep thinking they're thinking the way we are. We're humans, they're dogs, they're horses. They all, you know, they all think differently. And if you just are patient and watch the scenario, like you were saying, Tigger, it really it really pays off. I was pretty proud of my pup today. Well, I have to say that I was really proud of Keen today because I was at quadrille practice and one of the riders grooms always takes him for me, right? Mm -hmm. And as long as Keen sees me, he's cool. So Mm -hmm. I came over to where they were sitting. Yes, I experienced that. (laughs) under, Under the gazebo, just so I could lean up against the fence, right? And he comes and he jumps up on up to me from behind, not up on my shoulders, but you know, like pay attention to me. Here I am. And I went, eh, eh, and he dropped right back down and sat. And, and there were other people sitting there and they were like, Whoa. Yeah. So, um, I, I find that using noises, especially with Aussies is really effective. You know, you don't have to yell at them. Just go, yeah. Eh, or, mm-hmm. Oh, Oh, because they're, they're sensitive to that stuff. But anyway, Absolutely. if if for all our listeners, if you have some dog training bad habits, please share it with us. Yeah. Just feel better. <laughs> <laughs> and send us a postcard. That's right. Send us a postcard to 
Biostar US, 1 Cleveland Street, Suite 800, Gordonsville, Virginia, 22942. Alternately, you can write your training bad habit on the back of an extra large print playing card and put a stamp on the corner and send it to that same address. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or you can email us. <gasps> yes. There's an idea. There. But we, we or, really like handwritten things or on a yeah. doggy bag. That would be cool. Oh, that would be good. Oh my gosh. Or you could actually just contact us too on Facebook. We need, <laughs> we do need to let people know that's still that's still good. Okay. Healthy Critters Radio on Facebook. On Facebook. On Facebook. On Facebook. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hello, Penny. Hello, my friends. How are you? We're, We're good. good. How are you? You're good. Oh, lovely. That's so nice. <laughs> How are you? I'm so hungry. Oh. Sorry to hear that. Hedwig, are you always hungry about this time of the evening or has your servant slipped up and is feeding you late? Well, it is currently 6-5-0 and I am supposed to be fed at 5-0-0. Zero, zero. <laughs> Sorry so to hear that. the servant is really in trouble, but I just, you know, I don't have the heart to even feed on her anymore. She just will not perform. <laughs> So you, you've sad. given up on your servant? Is that what you're saying? Because, you know, right now I'm just tired and hungry. Maybe I can return to disciplining her later, but I've done my best, you know? Yeah. You well, you're hungry. I can see why you're tired. Best. You're very hungry. Yeah. I, I'm faint from hunger. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, in your currently faint state, Hedwig. We had a listener question submitted for mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Oh, excellent. excellent. Yes. I, I, I respond. That's right. The listener question, the, the uh, name of this listener is going to be Mary. Her name has been changed okay. to protect the innocent. Mm-hmm. And she oh. wants to know, why are small dogs so vocal? Oh, well, you know... <laughs> So many reasons. First of all, Mary, who I believe is actually called Tigger, <laughs> we are vocal because we are frequently overlooked. And so we know that we must attract attention to our needs by doing all our research. Another reason, Tigger, is that little dogs are. And so, to get our lazy staff to protect us, we must raise the alarm. We're extremely intelligent, and we're trying to raise the IQ level in the room by adding to dialogue. But, you know, you people are not capable of keeping up. So that would be a, yeah, I think. My sister is not as vocal as I am. She says she's mostly just given up. (laughs) Sometimes she howls like a tiny little wolf, which is quite entertaining for the servant because then she says, look at the little wolf. And my sister looks at her like, look at the giant (laughs) nitwit. Sorry. So I always like to see that exchange, you know, brings joy to my little heart. <laughs> well, I always thought it, little dogs barked just because they know it's a, annoying. No, it's because you're inadequate. <laughs> Literally, I just, I just, I just ducked. I just ducked when I, I was like, "Oh, Tigger, you're so brave and dumb at the same time." <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I sometimes think that, too. <laughs> Thanks, Hetty. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. I like to contribute. You're so good. You know, it is my personal policy to say true things out loud. Out loud, yes. Mm. Well, thanks, Hetty. I hope you get home and get dinner fast. 
yeah, I won't though. That's never going to happen. I've given up. <laughs> well, well, hopefully you you'll start start serving my your voice. Yeah, I will. Don't worry. I'm on it. Okay. Thanks, Eddie. Bye, Bye Eddie. Eddie. Bye. And now it's time for the breed of the show. So we are at the breed of the show, and I thought I would do the Basenji. I don't know, Tigger, if you've ever actually met one. I think I've met one. I have met one, but I've never okay. met one. Yeah. It, just an interesting dog. They're they're known as the African barkless dog. So they ar- originated from Africa. They actually were bred for hunting lions, which is kind of interesting. They're They're not a very big dog. They're a smaller, short coat, kind of a square breed. AKC called, says they're a hound. But they're, they're small, erect ears, kind of a cute curly tail. They're known for their little um, wrinkles in their forehead and sort of almond-shaped eyes. They're really quite an attractive dog. And again, they're not very big. Like the males are like 24 pounds. The females are about 21. They come in a bunch of different colors, like you know, try brindle and red. They're like I said, they're very, very cute. But the big thing about them is they are barkless. <laughs> they're known to be barkless. And so they make this unusual yodeling sound. There's a, one one place that I was looking at said so they called a I'm not gonna probably say this right, called a baru. And it's it's due to their unusually shaped larynx that they that they don't bark. But having said that, they can still make quite a racket. They can make a high pitched sort of scream. They make they, so they still they still make noise because a lot of people I when I've talked to them about it before have been like you know do they just make no noise at all? They're very cat like, so they can be very quiet in what they do, but they still make qu- quite a bit of noise. They are um, <laughs> so I'm just gonna I'm gonna start off with with some of the things that I found very interesting. There is a um, I, I guess a book that that goes through like the most trainable breeds. <laughs> They're like second on the list for the least trainable breed. <laughs> so I think that they um, they they are probably very much they they are very interactive. They're highly intelligent, but they're not very easy to train. They're very cat like, meaning like they don't like water. They will do tons of things to avoid things that they don't want to do. They're energetic, they're curious, and they're very, very smart. They can be reserved with with strangers and actually become very, very attached to a single person. They, kind of like greyhounds, they're very graceful um, animals. They're very, you know, they, they're very good athletically. But because of their deep, they really singly become attached to their person, you have to be very careful in how you leave them alone. Because if they're alone too long and not be interactive, like going for walks or, you know, mentally being stimulated by their person, they can be a little bit destructive. Having said that, they apparently have very great personalities um, and can be kind of comical and be very cuddly. And another interesting thing that I found, and this is, I'm not sure if this is an actual truth or not, but um, there is some sort of genetic link to barkless dogs. This is going to be really bizarre. Only coming into heat once a year. Have you ever heard anything like this, Tigger? Yeah, it's kind of. It, and I don't know. It, it, so they literally more the more this obviously Basenjis in particular, but they ha- there's this link between barkless dogs and only coming into heat, which then makes them a little bit harder to breed and obviously produce more puppies, which, you know, just, just kind of an interesting, I'm not really sure what the correlation is there, but they have a very strong prey drive. So you have to be careful about them with other, like with cats. Like if you want to bring home one of these guys, you have to be very, very careful, introduce them slowly to your family. But because of their, their energy and, you know, their, their, they're wanting to be with one person. I, I, you know, it seems like this would not be a great dog for somebody that wants to, you know, go to work all day. This is, um, a good dog that 
if somebody wants a companion to have with them all the time, which is great, they can be trainable. They are trainable. We were talking about this earlier about, you know, what this is a dog that has to have a lot of follow through and patience. They don't recommend, um, because they're a hound and it's more, they're more of a sight hound to like try to take them off the leash. We had a, um, I was telling you this earlier, Tigger, we had a Shiba Inu. It was very similar to this. Very, very smart dogs. They are, are trainable when they want to be trainable, extraordinarily affectionate with their, with their, their families, um, but can be a little tough. But having said that, they're kind of adorable. You have to, you should Google <laughs> the sound that they make that's considered a, a yodel or the, the, uh, the baru. But they are just, they're just an adorable dog, but probably one you would really want to consider before taking it if you're not home all the time. And probably not a good apartment dog. So now we're at Critter Nutrition. And today's topic is flavorings in feeds and supplements. It's difficult to find a bag of feed or even a supplement that doesn't have natural or artificial flavorings as an ingredient. The term natural flavoring sounds innocuous, perhaps a nice apple flavor from a real apple or carrot flavor from a real carrot. How about delicious real meat juice as a natural flavoring in dog food? The sad truth is natural flavorings are created in laboratories using hundreds of chemical compounds. Only one component of a natural flavoring must come from a plant, tree, spice, vegetable, yeast, meat, poultry, eggs, or dairy products, whose significant function is flavor, not nutritional. Some natural flavorings are actually made up of 200 blended chemical additives. According to research by the Environmental Working Group, Quote, natural and artificial flavors really aren't all that different. In the livestock business, flavorings are often called palatants. The use of palatants are to encourage animals to eat more. Much of the feed for animals is made up of the starchy grains, corn, millet, barley, because feeding carbs is cheaper than feeding fats. It has been estimated that as many as 75% of the cattle and hogs eat palatant during their lifetimes. Remember, farmers growing animals for food want their animals to get big as fast as possible before they go to slaughter. Why do we need flavorings? The answer to this lies partly in the agricultural revolution that began after World War II. The impetus to grow more food meant that that how the food actually tasted was not as important as growing a lot of food. It was quantity over quality. New hybrid seeds plus an arsenal of fertilizers meant that farmers could produce more per acre, resulting in more food, yes, but less taste, and in the words of a famous chef, blandness. The blandness in part comes from lower nutritional content, higher carbohydrate content, and more moisture content of the food. There is even a term for this, dilution. Not only is the food bland that humans eat, so are the feeds and concentrates and supplements that horses, dogs, cattle, pigs, goat, sheep, and chickens eat. Animals and humans are less inclined to eat bland food, so flavorings are added to stimulate smell and taste. Flavoring chemicals give food specific smells that the food industry calls flavor. The same mixture of chemicals would be called fragrance if in cleaning products, perfumes, or personal care products. Smell makes up to 80% of the sense of taste. If the food smells good to a horse, dog, or human, the brain thinks it will taste good too. There are taste receptors in the GI tract. These are the sensors for fat, protein, bacteria, hormones, and plant compounds. These receptors play an important role in how humans and animals feel during and after eating. The flavor industry is part of the fragrance industry and is estimated to rake in $24 billion annually. Clearly, this is not a small industry. The size of this industry highlights just how much of our food, our horse's food, our dog's food, contains flavorings. 
In a 2011 interview on 60 Minutes with Morley Safer, two flavor scientists from the company Givaudan said that one of their goals was making food addictive. Flavorings contain solvents, emulsifiers, and preservatives, which can make up the majority of ingredients in each specific flavoring itself. Take apple flavoring, for instance. As many as 50 chemicals can be used to approximate the taste of an apple. Horses and dogs and humans crave variety in foods. Fake flavors disguise foods that are similar and make them seem more different than they really are. The flavor technology of fake flavors applied to bland food induces the sense of smell and tricks the brain into a heightened level of pleasure. Like a person with alcoholism or drug addiction always needing more in order to get that initial experience of high or bliss, the more we eat food with flavorings, the more we crave. The book, The Dorito Effect, highlights why we can't eat just one Dorito. It's not the corn chip itself or even the fat it is fried in. It is the taste coming from a concoction of flavoring chemicals, a kind of opiate for the brain and extra pounds for the body. Bottom line is our industrial food system grows food that has more carbohydrates and moisture and literally no taste. Due to the years of chemical fertilizer and pesticide applications, the soil no longer provides enough nutrients to the plants, so fortification is necessary in the form of synthetic or coal tar derivative vitamins. When we eat wild blueberries or organic heirloom tomatoes, we tend to eat less and not pig out like we do on Big Macs, soft drinks, and chicken nuggets. This is because real food provides a deeper satiety from the complex of nutritional factors in food. And another component, toxins. Organisms like plants contain small amounts of toxins. For instance, the tiny amount of cyanide in apple seeds. One theory is that mammal and human brains and GI tracts evolved a system to regulate the consumption of toxins. When we eat real food, we become satiated, and the dose of toxins in the food doesn't hurt us. The problem with food today is that the food we grow on an industrial scale is less delicious. The food that we, our horses and our dogs, should not eat, flavorings, byproducts, highly processed ingredients, tastes more, much more exciting. The MSG connection. MSG is a flavoring found in pet foods such as hydro hydrolyzed protein, among other names. AFCO allows pet food companies to call it natural flaving, flavors or natural flavorings. There are other ingredients that often contain MSG or create MSG in processing. Maltodextrin, protease, carrageenan, citric acid, cornstarch, gelatin. MSG overstimulates the nervous system and can cause an inflammatory response. MSG has been called an excitotoxin because it overexcites cells to the point of damage. In equine feeds and supplements, MSG may be labeled as protein isolate, texturized protein, natural flavors, autolyzed yeast, hydrolyzed yeast, yeast extracts, soy extracts or concentrate, and glutamate. Getting flavorings out of the diet. It's important to read listing on equine feed labels. Whole food component products like Cool stands for new gold, alfalfa pellets, Timothy pellets, whole flax seeds, chia seeds, whole oats do not contain flavorings of any kind. Organic or cold-pressed oils like hemp and coconut and camelina and flax do not have flavorings. However, highly processed oils like vegetable, soy, corn, and canola can have flavorings. Check the labels on your supplements. Most all supplements for horses contain natural or artificial flavorings and the often hidden MSG. Remember, it is not just the amount of chemical additives and flavoring. It is how those chemicals and the ingredients they are combined with over time affect the body system at large and the GI tract in particular. Real horses and real dogs are healthier, perform better, and recover more quickly on real food. That's why Biostar empowers horse and canine owners with 100% whole food nutrition, supplements, and feeding programs. 
Biostar products are made at their own certified non-GMO facility in Gordonsville, Virginia, using real fruit ingredients that are raw, freeze-dried, or dehydrated, never cooked, and are free from artificial flavors, colors, soy, corn, wheat, and molasses. The Biostar product line includes a wide range of whole food, horse and dog supplements, treats, and unique artisan poultices that embrace the ancient and traditional uses of clay and plants. Visit BiostarUS.com today and learn about whole foods and canine and equine nutrition so you can make the best decisions about the care and health of your horses and dogs. That's BiostarUS.com. Whole food nutrition the way nature intended. So we're at Coffee Clatch. And I got the idea of what it would be like to be Dr. Doolittle and be able to talk to the animals. And then I thought, well, that'd be so interesting to talk to some wild animals. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) in my madcap way, um, I thought this would be a really great topic for Coffee Clatch. And I'm going to start off with my first animal, which is I would really like to talk to a giraffe. Oh, I had that too. You did? Yes. Okay, now I need to know, why do you each want to do, walk, talk to a giraffe? What do you want to ask them? Well, What it's just... like to have your brain so high in the air. <laughs> oh, that's so funny, because I wanted to know if they ever got a sore throat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's a long distance, you know? It's oh, that, really yeah. Long distance. Oh. I and oh, just how elegant they are. I mean, they are, but even when they canter, they they're so beautiful. I know. What and how it, they hold their necks that way. What mm-hmm. is it about a giraffe that, regardless of what speed he is actually moving at, they always look like they're in slow motion? Yeah, I know. Most, I think they're one of the most fascinating creatures to watch. They're they're my second most fascinating creature for them. Good one, Tigger. Yeah. All right, Patty. Well, okay. My first one, which was above giraffe, but giraffe was really right there, was a lion. Uh Um, I've always been so fascinated by lions, but I want to know what it would be like to just have that. I'm thinking of male lions. Just what it's like to have that big mane and big square, beautiful head. And those gigantic but, paws. Yeah, but what's it like to roar? Oh, like, that would be a great oh, that's a thing. Good like, I like that. Yeah. What's it like to roar? Like that has got to be empowering all the way down to your toes. I like it. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jennifer? Well, my first one is a cheetah. Mm. Ah. I love cheetahs. And this was inspired by our recent trip to the Big Cat Sanctuary down in Florida. When we, when we went on a cruise, we went down on Day Lorley and went to the Big Cat Rescue, where they take in and give forever homes to cats who were formerly pets and not cared for properly. And that was kind of cool. And cheetahs are a solitary cat. <clears throat> and you often see them sitting up in trees. And they look like they're actually thinking about something. I, I, I think cheetahs are doing physics in their head or something. <laughs> There's something I always about think me. of them as sort of the philosophers yeah. or the Zen Buddhists of the cat, big cat family. They're, they're <laughs> contemplating the meaning of, of the universe <laughs> yes, inside there. Exactly. And I want to ask them mm. about that. Or they already know it. Or they know and it so already. You're, yes. That understanding. Yeah. Yes, they're there in the in the tree branch. Yes. That's mm-hmm. that's my first one. Well, my second one is a killer whale. Oh. Oh, good one. I've had dreams of of riding whales. Really? <laughs> um, <laughs> and I I would just like to talk to a killer whale and find out what it's like to live in a pod of of whales and and how they talk to each other and move through the, the water. And they always remind me of a pinto horse that is a water creature. 
and they're known as the wolves of the sea. So they're highly intelligent. I'd love to know what what they're thinking, what they're working out, what what goes on with the babies and the uh, adults and the young adults when they're all swimming together and working together. So I'd, I'd sort of like to sit on a beach and have them all come up out of the water and chat. Chat. <laughs> <laughs> My image. <laughs> Chatting with killer whales. Patty? Well, okay. <laughs> My last one is a hawk. Yes. I. What's it like? I, I would just like to know what it's like to fly. L- like, like, the, and uh, just to, what it what it would be like to fly and and to be able to have that kind of sight. Mm-hmm. You know, and just what it's like to be, just you know, floating over the earth and. And what what is it, and just being able to see the way they can see, what what is that like? Vision thing. That's interesting. Yeah, the yeah. vision thing. Yeah. Jennifer. All right, my next one is a fox. Oh, good. and I want to quiz a particular fox. <laughs> I would like to speak with the fox that navigates his way around the perimeter of our property on a daily basis. And I'm going to ask him a very, very specific question. Where's why your waste you, coat? <laughs> why do you need to mark my horse's feed tubs and hay nets? <laughs> why? <laughs> why do you need to He's poo in the feed the tub? Girl, the woman, why do you need the to the pee on the hay net? <laughs> <laughs> why? Because no matter how much you scrub... That ain't coming out. <laughs> wow. Yes, That's actually. interesting. Yes. He sprays the hay net. If I put the hay net on the fence where it's low enough, he will spray the hay net. And if I leave the feed bucket out there and don't pick it up and take it back to the barn, he pees in it or he poos in it. Oh, no. Whoa. Yes, he does. Or she. I don't know which. Seems like a very male thing to do. It does. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's no offense honest. to our male listeners, but yes, it does yeah. seem like a, a guy thing to do. Uh, like, mm-hmm. you know, marking the territory or yeah. leaving a message for a female. There's so many trees to choose from. So many trees and fence posts. Maybe that's <laughs> why, because there's nothing else in the field except trees, giant trees. There's nothing else there except a feed tub and a hay net. Maybe if I put 50 hay nets out there, he'd go, oh, well, no big deal. I don't need to mark that. Yeah. Or he'd mark them all. Or, or he'd, he'd mark, mark them all. He'd, or he'd really, he'd really. He'd go, oh, my God, God I don't have enough. As much on each this. one, which, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So my my last one is is an uh, a sea otter. Of course it is, because you're the otter whisperer. Um, and it would just be great to lie on my back in the water with a sea otter and, you know, find out what it, what it's like to hang out and mm. eat clams and take care of your babies and not care about the cold. You just and, want to shoot the breeze and drink a beer with an otter, don't you? I, I That's exact. And you know what? I can see a sea otter tossing back a cool one. Absolutely. <laughs> what kind of beer know. would a, a sea otter drink? Ah, um, it wouldn't be light beer. <laughs> no, I think he'd be going for yeah. He'd be going for probably a craft beer with uh, plenty of uh, you know barley in it, but not mm. one of those dark Guinnessy kind of ones. I don't think so. No, it'd be too heavy. Yeah, maybe some little, I, a blue moon maybe because he's kind of a citrusy kind of guy. Yeah, you're so funny. Yes. I think that's. What I, he's I doing. know nothing about beer. <laughs> Yeah. That's so funny. That's well, if you have an animal that you would love to talk to that's a wild animal, send us who, what kind of animal that is and why on a postcard to Biostar US, 1 Cleveland Street, Gordonsville, Virginia, 22942. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks to our sponsor, Biostar US. You can find them online at biostarus.com. Get the Horse Radio Network phone app on iOS or Android by searching for Horse Radio Network in the App Store. It's free and easy to use. 
For details about today's show, go to HealthyCrittersRadio.com, where you can find links, photos, and more information about our guests. As always, we love your feedback. Please follow us on Facebook under Healthy Critters Radio. Be sure to visit all the great shows on Horse Radio Network at HorseRadioNetwork.com. Love your dog. Hug your horse. Feed your chickens. Clean your litter box. Dance with your goat. Slither with your snakes. Howl at the moon. Hang with your hamster. Party with your parrot. Waddle with your walrus. Outwit your otter. Cuddle your cows. Rap with your raptor. Go chipping with your chipmunks. Forgive your fox. While hedging your hog. We also recommend that you rack with your raccoon. Gyrate with your giraffe. Meditate with a meerkat. Uber with your orangutan. Facebook with your flamingo. Ponder with your panda. Walk with your wookie. Yawn with your yak. Twitter with your toucan. Go raining with your reindeer. Dropbox your dragon. (laughs) 